The National Broadcasting Company presents, transcribed, Sir Lawrence Olivier in Theatre Royal. This is Lawrence Olivier. Today's story is one of Robert Louis Stevenson. It comes from a collection which the author himself called The New Arabian Nights. And that perhaps gives you something of the flavor of this story, which is set in London in the 19th century. I myself shall play the role of the storyteller in this adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's The Suicide Club. This is the story of a frightening adventure. I do not propose to tell you my name, and after you've heard the story, you will perhaps understand why not. It was an adventure into which I was drawn more by curiosity than anything else. I certainly had no idea at the time of the terrible events in which the adventure would involve me, or of the tragedy in which they would end. In any event, this is how it all began. I was sitting with a friend one night in an oyster bar not far from Leicester Square. What's wrong, man? That fellow doing over there. The, the one who's just come in. Huh? He seems to be with those two commissionaires. He's got a dish of something or other, haven't they? Seem to be offering everyone something to eat. <laughs> what are they? Pies or something? Oh, yes, they look like it. Some sort of tarts, I think. Yes. Good Lord, they're, they're cream tarts. Cream tarts in an oyster bar. The <laughs> fellow seems to be giving them away. I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, maybe it's a wager or something. <laughs> well, well, it looks as if we're going to be offered some, too. You, sir, will you do me the honor of eating one of these tarts? I can answer for the quality of the pastry. I've eaten 27 of them myself since 5 o'clock. Oh, 27? That's rather a lot, isn't it? As a matter of principle, sir. Every time my offer is rejected, I insist on eating the tart myself. So you can be sure that there's nothing wrong. Well, I'm sure there isn't, but I, I never accept a gift unless I'm aware of the spirit in which it is offered. And then I shall have to admit that it's offered in a spirit of mockery. Mockery? <laughs> Whom are you mocking? I haven't the time to explain my philosophy, sir. I'm simply distributing cream tarts. But I certainly include myself, if anyone is to appear ridiculous. You do? Yes, indeed. Ah, so, oh, will you oblige right. me by helping yourself? Oh. Otherwise, I shall have to eat my 28th, and I've really had more than enough. All right, then, Colonel. We'll help you out. <laughs> On one condition, if my friend and I both eat your tarts, you must join us for supper out. <laughs> well, I've several dozen still on hand, so I'll have to visit a few more bars before I've got rid of them all. If you're already hungry, gentlemen, I... No, not at all. My friend and I will go the round with you. It looks a very pleasant way of passing an evening. <laughs> Stupid. Splendid. <laughs> two tops for the gentleman. Oh, <laughs> mm. Delicious. Ah, I perceive you're a connoisseur. <laughs> well, there was obviously a story behind all this nonsense. My friend and I were anxious to hear it. We chose a little French restaurant in Soho, ordered a private room, a very good meal, and champagne for the occasion. The young man ate surprisingly well, despite his rather sickly hors d'oeuvre, and over the dessert we persuaded him to begin his explanation. <laughs> There's every reason why I shouldn't tell you my story. So perhaps that's why I'm going to do so. Ah, good for you. <laughs> I come from quite a respectable family, you know, and I started life with quite a reasonable fortune. I went in for all the usual ways of getting rid of it. Good living, gambling, yes. love affairs, uh, all the rest of it. In fact, I thought myself quite a man of the world. <laughs> I had a lot of amusing adventures. Even fought a duel when I was in Paris. Oh, By the time I began to come to my senses, I had very little fortune left. And promptly fell in love. Uh, uh, after I had nothing left to offer the young lady, I came to the sad conclusion that there was really nothing very much left to live for. No. I got rid of all the money I had left under the last 80 pounds, which left me just 40 pounds to get rid of during the course of today. 40 pounds? What happened to the other 40? That went for a very particular purpose. Well, I've spent a very amusing day getting rid of my last few pounds on the cream tarts over which we met. <laughs> and I wanted to close a foolish life in a, in a particularly foolish manner, which you must admit I did. Well, I shouldn't deny that, but what happens next? Oh, I'm not complaining. And at least I'm not a coward. I've lived my life and enjoyed it. So now I simply have to get rid of it. Get rid of it? You mean... You mean kill yourself? Hmm? Well, who, who, who hasn't often thought of doing that? 
You know, um, young fellow, it's a curious coincidence that out of the whole of London, you went and picked on a couple of people in much the same position as yourself. Yes. What? Mm. Yes. You mean you're ruined too? Mm -hmm. uh, it is this very excellent supper a last extravagance as well? <laughs> like my cream tart? <laughs> well, near enough. And just to get rid of any slight disparity, let's put five pounds here on the table to cover the bill and have you a match? Yes. Thank you. Burn the rest. Like this. What the devil are you doing? Don't be an utter fool. Well, aren't we all? But good heavens, haven't you got any money left at all now? Why didn't you keep your 40 pounds? 40 pounds? Why not 40 pounds? Oh, for that matter, why not 80? <laughs> you must have earned the best part of 100. Well, 40 pounds would have been enough. But without that, no admission. They're very strict about the rules. <laughs> Fine business when you can't even die without money. Now, I think you'd better explain yourself. Do I have to? Mm, if please. you haven't the 40 pounds, what's the point? Well, I happen to have enough for both of us. Thank if we sir. really needed it. I thought you were in the same straits as I was. I seem to remember that you had 80 pounds yesterday. Yes. Yes, I had. You're not fooling me. You, you are as desperate as I am. Oh? Well, bored with life, if that's what you mean. Yes, indeed. I thought I'd made that clear enough by burning my last money. Perhaps you can afford to burn a hundred pounds or so. Well, I'm no millionaire, if that's what you mean. No. Well, here's to your health. <laughs> <laughs> and good night, my merry ruined man. Oh, no, you can't get out of it like that. You tell me that you're desperate, and I accept the fact. Why should you have less confidence in me? In either of us. Yes, why? Then you're not joking. You really are. Well, like you, we've had enough of life. Yes. Haven't we, Colonel? Yes, I uh, have. Sooner or later, <laughs> alone, not together, we're prepared to put an end to it. That's quite Aren't right we, Colonel? Mm, yes. yes, well, now that we've come across uh, you, and since you seem to be in a hurry, well, we can make it tonight just as easily. Quite, why, why not? Why not all three of us together? Yes, why not? That really goes for you as well, Colonel. Yes, yes, certainly, provided you something in mind. And you really can put up the 80 pounds between you. Oh, I think so. 50, 10, 20, 40, 60... Eighty pounds and a few left over. Yes, you can forget about the rest. Forty pounds each is the entrance fee. The entrance fee? Entrance fee to what? To the suicide club. The suicide club. Even the name of it made my flesh creep. But when this amiable young man went on to explain himself a little further, I could scarcely believe he wasn't joking. This, he said, is an age of conveniences, and only the one convenience lacking to civilized living and modern comfort, a decent, easy way to quit the stage, the back stairs way to liberty, or as he liked to call it, death's private door. And that, he carefully explained to us, has now been supplied by the suicide club. Just how it's managed or who started the club, I don't exactly know. But what I do know, I'm under the strongest oath not to divulge. But I can say this. If you are really tired of life, both of you, I'll take you to a meeting of the club. And if not tonight, at least sometime within the week, you'll quietly cease to live. And you say that you're a member of this club? Yes, I paid my subscription today. I shall be going there in... What time is it? Yes, in half an hour. You've just got half an hour to make up your minds whether you're coming with me or not. If you were serious, then you've nothing to lose. I'll be back for your decision. In half an hour, gentlemen. <laughs> Whether the man was serious or not, we couldn't quite decide. Indeed, the only way to settle the question was by taking him up on his offer and going along with him to see what happened. Admittedly, it might be dangerous, or it might be no more than a plan to rob us of 80 pounds. Somehow, we couldn't believe that. If the worst came to the worst, well, we could still afford to lose the money for the sake of the adventure. It must have taken us only a few minutes to make up our minds to see the adventure through to the end. Now, you have made up your minds, both of you. You don't want to draw back while there's still time. No, we're not in the habit of drawing back, either of us. No. Very well, then. We'll take a four-wheeler. Cab! Wait, sir. Drive us to the address on this piece of paper. Very good, sir. After you, gentlemen. Well, gentlemen, in the circumstances, you'll appreciate that a certain amount of secrecy is called for until you're actually enrolled in the club. You'll forgive me if I take the precaution of blindfolding you both. Is that necessary? Yes, I'm afraid it is. You see, gentlemen, this is not a joke. Our journey took us to a part of the city with which I was not familiar. In fact, I had absolutely no sense of our direction except that it was east and that the journey was a lengthy one. The cab stopped at last in a dark street 
and the young man paid it off. He took the bandages off our eyes and invited us to follow him down an alleyway. He knocked at the door. The door was opened and we were ushered into an entrance hall. The young man left us for a few minutes and we heard voices. At last, an inner door was opened and we found ourselves in the presence of the president of the club. Sit down, gentlemen. I'm told you wish to see me. We wish to join your club, sir. The Suicide Club. The Suicide Club? What sort of club is that? Well, that's what we've come to find out. It's for you to say. I think there must be some mistake. This is a private house. I think I'd better leave. I don't like practical jokes. What the devil do you mean? We were brought here. Now, just a minute. Leave this to me. Now, I think you know very well what sort of a club we wish to join. Because our young friend has just told you all about us. I'm not the sort of man to be trifled with. And if you don't want trouble, you'll take our entrance fees, the 80 pounds... And introduce us to our fellow members. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> Forgive me, gentlemen. You appreciate I have to take precautions. So you wish to join the Suicide Club. May I ask your reasons? Well, I was a colonel. Till I was cashiered for cheating at cards. Hmm. And you, sir? Chill laziness. <laughs> laziness? Hmm. Angus, you must have a better reason than that. No, I should I have. I've lost all my money. Can't be bothered to make any more. <laughs> if I wasn't so experienced in these things, I should probably turn you both away. As it is, I happen to know that suicide is almost always committed for the most frivolous reasons. <laughs> Very well, then. If you are prepared to take the oath in the manner prescribed, you will be accepted as members. The oath, I need hardly say, is an oath of secrecy. We're careful to make it binding in the very highest degree. When you have taken the oath, if you're willing to do so, that is, then you'll be enrolled forthwith as members of the Suicide Club. Now, how long will that membership last? <laughs> well, well, that remains to be seen, gentlemen, doesn't it? But I don't expect you'll be kept waiting very long. In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. NBC sets the scene for relaxing Sundays at home with a variety of the finest entertainment. The NBC Symphony brings back brilliant Arturo Toscanini, conducting scores by Mendelssohn, Weber, and Richard Strauss, while your Sunday newspaper of the air, Weekend, offers the latest edition of the news and features under such famous bylines as Earl Godwin and Elmo Roper. And you won't want to miss the Marriott's newest adventure in matrimonial life as Ben and Liz anticipate a blessed event on the warm comedy drama series, The Marriage. So prop up the easy chairs and get set for fine Sunday listening tomorrow on NBC. And now we continue Theatre Royal with Sir Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> We have bound ourselves on oath to keep the secrets of the Suicide Club. Nothing could be conceived more passive than the obedient promise, or more stringent than the terms to which we had agreed. The man who broke that oath of silence could scarcely have a rag of honor or any of the consolations of religion left to him. We signed the document, but not without a shudder. The President received our entrance money and without more ado, took us through into the smoking room of the Suicide Club. There we were introduced to our fellow members. This, sir, full muster of the club? Oh, middling. By the way, if you have any money, it's usual to offer champagne. Oh. It keeps up a good spirit, and uh, it's one of my little perquisites. I shall have to leave that to you, I'm afraid, Colonel. Yes, and live four bottles, with my compliments. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Please make yourselves at home. We looked about us with interest. A few of the other members were much above 30. And one or two were still in their teens. They stood leaning on tables and shifting on their feet. Many of them were smoking nervously. Others had let their cigars go out. 
Some talked well, but the conversation of others was plainly the result of nervous tension. One man interested me intensely. He was probably upwards of 40, but he looked fully 10 years older. I've never seen a man more naturally hideous, nor one more ravaged by his excesses. He was partly paralyzed, and was the only man in the room who shared the composure of the president. I got into conversation with him. So you are newcomers, are you? Well, perhaps I can help to set your mind at rest. I've been coming here regularly for two years now. Two years? But I thought members could only expect to last for a week or so. Ah, yes, but my case is peculiar. I'm not, properly speaking, a suicide at all. Merely an honorary member. I only visit the club once every two months or so. My infirmity, you know. And I pay a special rate. Even so, my luck has been quite extraordinary. Your luck? I'm afraid I still don't really understand. Oh, no, of course not. An ordinary member who comes here looking for death, like you, returns every evening till fortune favors him. He can even live on the premises, quite cheaply. The president's company is worth the money in itself. Indeed, I shouldn't have thought it. Oh, but you don't know the man. The drollest fellow. What stories and what cynicism. I take it he's a permanency like yourself. The only permanency, really. So far, I've been graciously spared, but I must go at last. But the president never plays, of course. He shuffles and deals for us and makes all the necessary arrangements. He's been running the club for over three years and not a whisper of suspicion has been aroused. Quite astonishing when you come to think of it. And he assists? the members to commit suicide? Yes, indeed. The whole thing's in his hands. You remember the case last week, the man who was accidentally poisoned in a chemist's shop? I read about it in the papers. Beautifully arranged. Though one of our president's less racy notions. But how simple and how safe. You mean that man was one of the victims? I, I mean, uh, one of your members? Of course. Nearly every accident which you read about in the papers, in decent society, of course, is arranged for one or other of our members. Ex-members, I think. You don't say. have to forgive me. I'm still in the dark. You said that you've been lucky enough in lasting so long. I thought that the whole idea was to die as quickly as possible. Well, actually, but I, as I explained, I'm a special case. To me, the club is a sort of temple of intoxication. If I could stand the excitement, I should come here more often. As it is, I regard this as the ultimate in dissipation. I think I can say I've tried every other sort. I can well believe it, if you'll excuse me saying so. I'm flattered. Some people get their greatest excitement out of love or gambling or crime. To me, there's nothing so exciting as fear. In fact, you can envy me. I'm an utter coward. To such as me, the club offers particular excitement. It does. I'm still in the dark. How is the excitement, as you call it, arranged? Of course, I must tell you how the uh, victim, I think that was your word, how the victim is selected every evening. Uh, but not only the victim, the other member who is to act for the club and becomes death's high priest for the occasion. Good heavens, man. You mean they, they kill each other? Why, yes. The trouble of committing suicide is removed that you mean, way. You mean one of us may be picked this evening to, to kill one of the others? Why not? We should merely be doing him a service he requires. Would you refuse to oblige a friend? Well, since you say that the game is interesting and exciting, how is it played? You will see for yourself in a few minutes. Actually, the club combines the excitement of the gaming house, the duo, and the Roman amphitheater. The pagans did well enough, but it was reserved for our president to attain the absolute quintessence of excitement and fear. That hardly surprises me. But what is the game you play? An extremely simple one. The members sit round the table and the president shuffles and deals the cards, uh, one at a time to each member in turn. The member turns up his card, and I assure you, the suspense is almost unbearable. Exquisite. You mean one of the cards means that the member is to die? Exactly. The ace of spades is the card of death. And uh, the card that turns him into a murderer? We prefer to say appoints him official of the night. That's another ace. The ace of clubs. Now I could understand. Only too clearly. The man sitting by himself in the window, his head hanging, hands thrust deep in his trouser pockets, pale and sweating with fear, a wreck in soul and body. I could understand the cynical smile on the face of the president, the only one in the room who had nothing to lose by the game, who charged each man the price of his death or the hire of the killer. At last, we met again the man who had brought us to the club, the young madman of the cream tarts. 
Is this your first night here as a member? I take it that it is. Yes, as I said, quite a few of my friends have been members in the past. That's how I came to hear about it, while they were waiting for their ace of spades. You may remember a certain baronet who was crushed to death by a falling wall last month. Yeah, I seem to remember him. Was he a, a member as well? He brought me with him to the door the night of the accident. Nobody outside this room knew what really happened to him. I said a member who obliged him was drowned in a boating accident the following weekend. I hope to be as fortunate. On well, your first night, isn't that rather unlikely? I'm lucky at love, you know, lucky at cards. <laughs> I lay you five to one that I draw the ace tonight. I thought you'd spent your last sovereign on cream tart. Oh, I'm sorry, of course I did. Well, wish me luck anyway. Well, I wish you all that you wish yourself. I wish you the same. Uh, if it's your pleasure, gentlemen. Well, this will decide it. One way or the other. <laughs> folding doors had been thrown open and a whole room full of men began to pass into the next room. The gaming room itself was similar in every way to the one which we had left except for the furniture. The center of the room was occupied by a long green table at the head of which the president seated himself. In front of him was a pack of cards which he began to shuffle and cut with careful deliberation. Thirteen members sat down at the table. My friend and I, between the young man, and the semi-paralyzed honorary member. Very well, gentlemen. For the benefit of our new members, each of you must declare the card that's been dealt to him before I deal the card to his neighbor. Is that understood? Yes, certainly. Yes, yes. yes. Very well, then. I will begin to deal. Two of hearts. <laughs> Knave of spades. Ten of hearts. Queen of hearts. Three of clubs. Eight of diamonds. Seven of clubs. Knave of diamonds. Ace of hearts. Huh? No. No. I must ask you to declare your cards, sir. Huh? The ace of clubs. Oh, no. The ace of clubs. The card of the killer had been dealt to the young man of the cream tarts. He dropped it on the table, his face whiter than the pasteboard. Then left his place at the table and stumbled back into the smoking room. The excitement around the gaping table was now electric. The killer was known, and somewhere among the remaining twelve was the victim. Hope, fear, envy, and abject terror shone from the watching eyes of the players. Striking contrast to the cynical smile of the dealer. Five of hearts. King of spades. Four of diamonds. The card had now been dealt to every member on the table. The president began to deal the second round. Eight of clubs. Queen of spades. Five of clubs. Six of diamonds. Seven of spades. King of hearts. Two of diamonds. And once again, the deal had come round to me. As I turned my card on the table, my heart was pounding in my chest. Ten of hearts. And now it was the turn of my neighbor, the honorary member. Yes. No, no, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. The game for the night was at an end. Conversation broke out again among the members. The air had ceased to be electric. The president gathered up the cards again, replaced the pack in its box, then stretched and yawned like a man who has finished his day's work. But the honorary member, who had trifled with his fears one time too often, sat in his place with his head in his hands, drunk and motionless, a thing stricken down. As we left the room, the president beckoned to the young man of the dream tarts. 
the man who had hoped to die was receiving his instructions as official of the night. A friend and I made our escape as quickly as we could. Walking out into the darkness of the street, neither of us paused to find our bearings. The scene that we had witnessed was one we hoped never to see again. As for the club and its murderous president, the madness and criminal folly of its members, that was a matter which we were bound by the strictest oaths to keep undisclosed. After some rapid walking, we hailed a handsome cab which took us back to our homes and back to some degree of sanity. Next morning, my friend came round to call on me after breakfast. Well, have you seen it in this morning's paper? No. What? I haven't looked at the papers yet. Then read this. Double tragedy in London Square. Death fall from window. Read it. Brompton Square was the scene early this morning of a double tragedy. Mr. Bartholomew Malthus, well known in social circles, and Sir Andrew Flann were killed in a fall from the fourth floor window of the former's town residence. It appears that Sir Andrew had offered to assist Mr. Malthus up the stairs to his apartment as the latter was suffering from the effects of a partial stroke. On emerging from the lift, it is thought that Mr. Malthus must have been seized with an attack of giddiness which caused Sir Andrew to lead into an open window at the end of the corridor. It is thought that one of the gentlemen must then have stumbled and that the other, in trying to save him, was dragged through the window in his turn. The bodies were found in an area by a constable on his early morning round. The honorary member and the young man of the cream tarts. So he died after all. Was it murder and suicide? Or murder and accidental death? I wonder. Whatever it was, the world can spare them. Both of them. Yes. And only one thing lacking to make it poetic justice. You mean the president? Yes. The president of the suicide club. What was the ultimate fate of those other members of the club? Whether the club is still in existence, or whether the murderer whose brain conceived it came to a violent end in turn, that is something I shall never know. All I know is this, that I never read of a fatal accident in the papers now without wondering whether it was an accident or just one further member of an association of madmen, madmen whose 40 pounds had been paid to join the suicide club. This is Laurence Olivier again. I should like to thank the cast of this week's play, which was based on Robert Louis Stevenson's story, The Suicide Club, which included Milton Rosmer, Keith Pyatt, Robert Rietti, Paul Whitson Jones, and Eric Berry. Next week, I look forward to the pleasure of welcoming you once again to our program. Until then, au revoir, and thank you. Olivier starred in today's transcribed program. The script was by Derek Patmore. The music was under the direction of Sidney Torch. Theatre Royal is an NBC presentation produced and directed by Harry Allen Towers.